Hi there everybody, this is Sir James. I'm going to give you an update on what's been happening on Yugeshi Gold. For those of you that's new to the whole story, Yugeshi Gold is a social business that I started in 2011. The idea was basically that if I can make renewable energy simple enough, then you can give these ideas, train local communities to actually construct the components needed for themselves. I've actually done a bit of research around it and realized that that is actually quite viable. In fact, I found a few reports that refer to that at least 60% of all components you need for renewable systems, excluding PV panels, you can source locally. So I've been on a mission to see if I actually can work out a business model and get the financing needed to actually get this program off the ground and get rural communities to construct their own electricity and maybe have a surplus distributing back to the grid and making an additional income for themselves and get the business off the ground start more initiatives, get more people trained, etc, etc. So just to go back to the, to the beginning of this year, I came to Stellenbosch with the idea of, you know what, renewable energies, great, I have this idea, I can train them. You need to get a feel for what's going on in the sector before you just jump in and start a business. Like most people, do your research. And what I actually discovered is actually quite shocking. I knew that renewable energies is a big thing and I knew that the climate's in the it's in decline and there's all sorts of problems, but I didn't actually know the extent of it until I actually started doing this course. The major one of course is petrol prices going up, you probably all notice this by now, and it could be well connected to the oil peak. Now what the oil peak means is there was this guy in the seventies called Hubbard and he had this fairly fancy graph. Actually it's not, but he had this idea that the oil is going to run out at some point because, let's face it, it's a finite resource. You can only pump oil, eventually the oil runs, wells run out dry, right? So once these oil wells run dry, what happens next? And that's exactly where we are now. So Hubbard predicted that in the 70s, the U.S. will run out of, out of oil. He was spot on. And then he predicted that the world will run out of oil around the, the beginning of the 21st century. Now... Is that a coincidence and suddenly the whole world went oil crazy and there's been wars around and surrounding oil for quite a while. So the evidence that people believe his prediction is there. In fact, the more you look at the statistics, it looks like he could well be right. It's offset by maybe, he's maybe 10 years overdue. But uh, if you look at what they're doing these days to get oil, it's, it's remarkable. You know, deep sea drilling is getting more and more expensive and more elaborate. They're getting better at refining sludge and tar sands and all sorts of things that was previously unheard of. I mean, it was just too expensive to extract that type of oil. Why would you if you have got cheap oil? But now we're left with the scraping the bottom of the barrel, so to speak. But luckily, we humans are very, very smart. And we quite able, able to discover new technology. Unfortunately, a new technology has just been put into bare harvesting oil. So, even though the oil is running out, we're getting better and better and extracting it faster and faster. So, it looks like we're keeping up with demand. But are we really keeping up with demand because we have enough oil? Or just because we're getting better at producing it faster? Meaning the oil is going to go la 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 and then stop. And that's where the whole world is going in a bit of a panic. Let's face it, oil makes up 60% of all the energy use in the world. If we have to replace 60% of our energy use, what are we going to do? What are we going to replace it with? And how long is it going to take? Uh, see, America's got about 250 million cars on the road. Now, transport sector is just a small part that uses oil, but let's take that as an example. If we have to replace that 250 million cars with something running on electricity, we don't have anything else electricity, except electricity. So it's going to have to be electricity. How are you going to do that? You can't just say, okay, everybody come take on your car for a quick replacement. It's going to cost millions, if not billions. So the sooner we start, the bear. There's obviously a few other things to consider. The climate change, as you already, people are saying, oh, wait, what about the climate change? Yes, that is also a big great. But in the capitalist world, money talks. There's this thing that if you talk too much about climate, people start classifying you as a tree hugger. And they t not take you seriously because tree huggers are always extreme and they just there to hug trees and save the owls. <sighs> so you can't you can't talk to people of that. So rather talk to rather talk to figures. And oil is maybe our same in grace. 
the fact that there is an oil crisis we can maybe use this as an excuse to maybe change our ways. Unfortunately, there's other problems. There's an economic crisis already on the on the way. Uh, the euro is in, in in chaos. America is in serious debt, and they have droughts on top of that. They won't they won't say it's due to climate change, but they have serious droughts. And, and there's just a lot of chaos and more wars around the oil and oil instability and the price is just going up and up and it's getting harder and harder to make ends meet. But there are some good ideas. There's the end of the age of fire. There's one book that you can definitely that goes into it in the hydrogen economy. Going into an electric economy seems the way to go. And there's some very very good ideas on how we can systematically do it so we can so step one, we get like government support, change the policies and so forth, get everybody behind it, make sure the right people get the money and the support they need to lift up renewable energies. So as soon as we get enough energy, we can at least change over to something new when oil runs out. So we have to replace the 60%. Now, even if we have the infrastructure, we don't have the electricity anywhere. So Africa is an extreme example. We're already suffering with the lack of electricity. There's already a talk of going to one rand twenty per kilowatt hour, something like a hundred and ten percent increase over the next year or so. So electricity prices are set to spike, and there's talk of decommissioning other uh, coal power plants in the next twenty ten years, which is just going to put us back into oh we have a lack of it electricity and suddenly we need electricity more than ever because we can't use oil and what's going to happen to South Africa. Now I see like wow all these problems my my little social business might just fall right in place. So let's face it small businesses make up like 55 percent of the GDP in the country and it makes over 98 percent of the registered businesses in South Africa. So if you want to really get renewable energy is up and going fast, you have to distribute it. You can't get one big company like ESCOM to supply everything. And ESCOM has actually realized that that's why they're opening the national grid to independent power providers, getting the private sector on board to supply the energy they need. Because they can't mobilize their funds effectively by themselves. Again, they're making this process so difficult that no small business can get onto the market. You need to be rather big to actually apply for IPP status with, with NARSA. So what to do? Well, this is now where a nice little idea for Yugeshi Gold comes out. So if you can maybe have an umbrella company like Yugeshi Gold that actually fosters tiny little businesses, micro and small businesses, to make cheap little renewables, they won't be too small to sell directly to the grid. They might be too small to sell to anybody uh, specific like a mine. But if you can pool all those tiny little businesses and say, here you community build these, you community build these, and together we pool the electricity and we can sell it. Sure, sounds great and everything. So there's a couple of problems. The efficiency that you're going to get out of these systems is not going to be the same as you're going to get out of these fancy systems you get pre-built from America. It is locally sourced, so it's going to be a lot cheaper to build them. And when it comes down to levelized cost, there's the main component. How much does it cost over the lifetime? So if you get cheap components, they might not be as efficient, but they're very cheap. So cost per kilowatt hour will be cheap. You know, you're using poor people and unemployed to build the, comp the uh, components for you and scavenge for all the materials that's needed. They assemble it and they get a, a percentage of, of the kilowatt hours that they sell. So they're making a little income for themselves. The business makes the income and continues to grow and train more people. So it's a, lot more, it's a lot more sustainable model, but on its own, just selling electricity is not good enough because it's a fairly complicated program and then we're having only one or two or three, let's say, a few small wind turbines, for example, it's not going to make enough money for them to actually make a living. But there are other sources of income that should actually be considered. For one thing, so Africa is an extremely dirty country when it comes to our coal power plants. So we're actually the 12th biggest polluter in the world when it comes to our common emissions. In 1997, Kyoto Protocol that was signed. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about it, but just a quick, uh, quick review. The Kyoto Protocol is part of the Earth Summit. It came out of a couple of talks and it, it put 
a quota of how much the developed world has to de lower their carbon emissions so we can actually keep below the two degree increase in temperature in the world. So all the companies in those places are now obligated to lower their emissions. So this Kyoto Protocol put this clean development mechanism or CDM uh, mechanism in place. People to did carbon trading off the ground. Now what's carbon trading? Basically the concept is, works like this. You've got this fancy German engineering company. They're told, listen, you have to lower your carbon emissions. But they say, hey, we're Germans, we're hyper-efficient already. How the hell are we going to do it? So they say, well, that's not my problem. Pay someone to do it, I don't care. And that's exactly how it works. Instead of lowering your own carbon emissions, you fund another project that will lower the carbon emissions, or you can actually buy your carbon credits from another country. This is most of Africa now as a nice opportunity because we are a third world country for all practical purposes. We can lower our carbon emissions and because we're lowering our carbon emissions, we can sell the excess to, to Europe. Just to give you an example how this selling of clean air works. Let's say usually you plug in your, your business into the wall and you suck a scum power, which is the coal power, right? So that coal power puts this amount of coal carbon dioxide into the air dirty, it's gassy and whatever. So if you use green power instead, you use that amount less carbon or you produce that amount less carbon dioxide into the air. So that all that sector that you're using less is the saving that you're making. And that's whether based on the amount of carbon dioxide removed or mitigated, which you can then sell for a couple of euros back. So that's an additional source of income that uh, you guess you can definitely get hold of and it would definitely help these tiny little communities. You know, now suddenly they don't just get a little bit of money for actually selling electricity, but they're actually selling clean air as well, effectively. So now they're getting two streams of revenue. Obviously, it's a bit more complex than that, because uh, whether you can get a project like this registered for CDM is uh, totally different, because it's going to be a lot of smaller businesses under an umbrella company. So it's questionable whether that will work. But if it works, will definitely help a lot. There are obviously easier systems. The TREX system, how TREX work, is like, for example, Woolworths, right? They were very green income. So for all the green electricity you sell to the grid, they can then buy the certificates from you. So they say you put some green electricity into the grid, every kilowatt hour of green electricity produced, you get a certificate. You can say that Woolworths comes to you and say, we buy your green certificates, prove that we actually using that. So they taking responsibility for using that green electricity and they get a nice green label. So hooray everybody and good for Woolworths for saving the environment. Unfortunately, Trix isn't very plausible in South Africa because it's not a lot of trading going on here. It's, it's not a very regulated system. That's why it's so easy to get onto the system because it's not regulated. Unfortunately, the drawback is because it's not regulated. It's limited trading capabilities. But still, I mean, every little bit helps. So then you can sell the social upliftment part of the, the business. You can sell the green electricity part. You can sell the carbon part. And you can actually sell electricity as a part as well. There are other sources of inf uh, funding that I've seen as well. Part of it is business is going to create jobs. There's actually government incentive to actually help. With so not only the Department of Energy can get involved, the Department of Trade can get involved, and the Department of Industry can get involved. People want to see economic growth. And like I said, small business is a big part of that and employs a large percentage uh, of the, the workforce already just makes sense to get people to be self-sustaining and we get the energy security because now everything is produced locally pv panels are great don't get me wrong but what happens when china suddenly says we're not going to we close our doors we're no longer trading and there we go we can't get all of more pv panels we have to be sustainable sustainable means locally sourced first if we can build our own systems here and be independent of the rest of the world south africa can function much more efficiently and we can distance ourselves from this economic crisis that's that's brooding away and might actually get worse. So just in a nutshell, that's what I've been up to. Yugeshi Gold is looking a lot more positive because now I actually have multiple sources of income, not just electricity like I originally planned, but now I can get even government seeing if they want to like help this uh, social initiative. And it's, it's really looking very positive. So wish me luck. Let's see where this goes next.